Welcome back to the Current Events Bulletin Session. I'm David Eisenbud, and I'm, the, I guess, the chair of the session. A couple of announcements before we begin. First of all, this session is generously supported by a donation from Salilish Mukopade in honor of Satyendra Nath Bose and Mahadev Dutta and Pranab Sarkar to bring appreciation for mathematics to a broader audience. Our speaker, Elamin Elbasha, Dr. Elamin Elbasha, is a distinguished scientist at the Merck Corporation who works on health economics, disease modeling, and outcomes research. And he's going to talk to us about mathematics and the quest for vaccine-induced herd immunity threshold. You can put questions in the chat if you have them, and we'll either take them in real time or wait till the end of the talk. There'll be a little time for questions at the end as well. So, Dr. Elbasha, please continue. Uh, can you hear me okay first before I go in? Perfect, yes. Okay. Very well. Let me see if I can uh, share my my screen here. Uh, not yet. Let's see. Ah, there we go. Good. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Take it away. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, <clears throat> good evening, good morning, wherever you are. As David mentioned, my name is Elamin Albasha. I am from Merck, USA. Thank you for joining this talk. I will be talking about mathematics and the quest for vaccine in the use herd immunity threshold. Uh, before I get going with the talk, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be with you here today. Uh, especially, I would like to thank Dr. David Eisenbad, uh, Director for Mathematical Science Research Institute and Professor of Mathematics at the uh, University of California, Berkeley. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I would also like to acknowledge the support, contribution, and uh, collaboration of my, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Abba Gumel. He is a foundation professor at Arizona State University, professor of mathematics. Uh, thank you, Abba, for all the support you have. I wanna mention you first before I get going because I might not get enough time to thank you at the end. Uh, here is the brief introduction of what I'm gonna talk about. The outline consists of a brief uh, introduction where I will be providing some motivation for the topic. Then I will review some basic concepts that are really important for uh, level playing, as well as help us actually have some clarity about the concept of herd immunity threshold. Then I will review some basic uh, epidemiologic models, starting with a very simple perfect vaccine model. And then I progressively add more realistic features by adding an imperfect vaccine. And then I'll consider a model that has heterogeneous populations. And then I'll try to illustrate some of the points that we make here using the example of COVID-19. And finally, I will provide a summary and concluding remarks and, add, and, and, and then listen to some of the questions that you will have. So mathematical modeling and computer simulations have a long and rich history for analyzing the spread and control of infectious diseases. However, since the discovery of the virus uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that caused COVID-19, there has never been uh, such attention for mathematical modeling. Model has been used by many 
uh, government agencies, looked at a lot by news media as illustrated in, in the clips here in this, uh, in this slide. And, and also by other organizations for making serious decisions about how to respond to the pandemic. The, the, the slide on the left here suggests that the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, uses mathematical modeling to analyze and respond to the intervention by designing mathematical models and using the results of those models. Um, most importantly, actually, these models have been very, very critical in shaping the early response to the, the pandemic, as illustrated by some of these news clips. If you look at the one at the bottom of the slide, this uh, title from the Washington Post on March 17, 2020, talks about uh, an important scientific paper that actually shaped the policy response to the pandemic in the US and the United Kingdom. This slide highlights the result of one of the most influential models that has been used early on in response to the pandemic. Uh, it was developed at Imperial College London by a group of researchers led by Neil Ferguson as shown here at the bottom of the, the slide. The graph on the right shows one of the scenarios for the United Kingdom and for Great Britain and the United States, where if nothing is being done, there would be about half a million deaths in the UK, in, in Great Britain, and about 2.2 million uh, deaths in the US. Many think that these worst case scenario analyses were very instrumental in shaping the policy response in the US, UK, France, Germany, and other countries. The, the figure on the left shows the critical care beds that are needed as a function of various uh, responses to the pandemic. If nothing is being done as shown by the black curve here, uh, our healthcare system will be overwhelmed, will not be able to have enough critical bed to meet that demand. And, and a less serious intervention is done like that is very disruptive in terms of uh, locking people down, social distancing, our healthcare system will be overwhelmed. Luckily, uh, the policymakers have heeded this advice and various uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions were implemented. And, and we're also very fortunate, we're able to, to develop quickly uh, very effective vaccines and to deploy them. As a result of all of this, uh, I think millions of lives have been saved. But it's still there are some lingering questions that, that requires answer. And, and some of them are listed here in this slide. For example, what is the herd immunity threshold to achieve disease elimination in a local setting or for the pandemic to end globally? And how is this herd immunity threshold determined? And what factors influence the hit values? What will the pandemic ever end? How can the pandemic end? And when will the pandemic end? My talk will be focused a lot on the first uh, three questions. Uh, if we have time and energy, we'll try to address the, the last three questions. So I would like to introduce some basic concepts so that it would help us actually as we present some of the materials. The first thing is to define what we mean by herd immunity. Herd immunity is defined as a situation where enough people have acquired disease or vaccine-induced immunity to indirectly protect others who are susceptible. Herd immunity, if a threshold is defined at the minimum fraction of the susceptible population that needs to be immunized through vaccination or natural infection to achieve disease elimination in a local setting. And I would like to also introduce a very uh, important 
uh, concept called the basic reproduction number, and I'll be talking more about it. It's called R naught. That's the way it's being pronounced. It's defined as the number of secondary cases that one individual, infected individual, can produce if introduced into a completely susceptible population. This is the most talked about actual number since the since the, the beginning of the pandemic. It is being talked about by policymakers, by scientists, and by the news media. There are a, another two concepts that are related to it. It's called the vaccinated reproduction number. It's defined in a similar way, but in this case, it takes into account the fact that the population is not completely susceptible, a fraction of it is being immunized through vaccination. And then the last concept is the effective reproduction number uh, abbreviated as RT or RE is defined similarly. The difference between this one is that it takes into account time and also the population consists of both naive as well as exposed and immune individuals. So I will be talking a lot about the basic reproduction number R0 and the vaccinated reproduction number RV and why they're important for the concept of herd immunity threshold, but I would like to briefly touch on the effective reproduction number, mainly because it, because it changed over time. Uh, it is very important for understanding uh, the severity of the pandemic and how successful are the public health measures that have been implemented. If, if RT is significantly greater than one, we know that the pandemic is taking over up exponentially, but if it is less than one, then we know that cases are declining. Infection is happening, but cases are declining. The figure on the right actually is an example of how RT was estimated early on from the outbreak uh, in Wuhan, China. Early on, RT was significantly greater than one, but after the lockdown of January 23rd, cases dropped significantly. And by February 2nd or so, the, the, the cases started to, uh, the RT is becoming less than one and cases started declining in Wuhan, China. So I will move on to talk about some basic epidemiologic models. I will also try to give a very, very brief and selective history of these basic epidemiologic models. I wanted to highlight that Ronald Ross in 1911 was pioneer actually in terms of thinking of epidemic thresholds. Uh, in, in his study of the uh, malaria transmission through mosquitoes, Ronald Ross proposed the, his mosquito theorem to challenge the prevailing wisdom at the time that says that if you wanted to stop malaria transmission, you need to eradicate mosquitoes. He was able to show that is not necessary. All you need to do is to reduce the density of the mosquitoes below a given threshold to be able to stop malaria transmission. Uh, and an important milestone happened around 1927 when Kermack and McKendrick uh, published their famous epidemic threshold where they showed that for an outbreak to occur, the population density of susceptible person must exceed a critical value. Uh, it took several decades before other mathematicians were able to translate that critical threshold condition using the powerful mathematical concept that we defined earlier, the basic reproduction number R0. And they showed that for the epidemic to occur, the population density must exceed the inverse of R0. And for herd immunity to be achieved, the threshold for that is given by one minus the inverse of R0. A very simple formula that, only, that has only one parameter in it, R0. And because uh, the basic reproduction number can readily be estimated from data there has been several applications of this concept for several diseases and vaccines. This slide shows some of those diseases. For example, 
for Ebola, because the basic reproduction number is low, you don't have to vaccinate a lot of people to achieve herd immunity. The threshold is, is close to 30%. But for highly infectious disease like measles, the, the vaccination, the, the, the herd immunity threshold is really higher than it's close to 95%. Um, I also show in this slide, um, the threshold for SARS-CoV-2 Given the early estimates at the beginning of the pandemic before the new variants of concern emerged, it's around 60%. And we'll be talking more about COVID-19 later on. So I'd like to provide some framework for how this has been derived by introducing the very simple compartmental model called the SIR. It's called SIR because it, it divides the population into compartments, the susceptible, infectious, and the recovered. And I included a perfect vaccine here, perfect in the sense that it provides 100% protection that lasts the lifetime of the individual. And, 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 and the model here assumed that the population is homogeneously mixing. And so, uh, the model uh, states that newborns are born susceptible, but a fraction of them can be uh, vaccinated and, 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 and move into the removed category. Those who are susceptible can get infected at this rate and become infectious, but after a period, they can recover and join the recover class. This simple model actually is, is really powerful. It's the, whole, the workhorse of mathematical epidemiology and you can derive many inside bids on this model. The, the next slide will outline the ordinary differential. This is a deterministic system of ODEs. It is given here three, three, um, three equations. The last equations actually can be ignored for now, but the two first equations are really important. The definition of the state variables as well as the important parameters is given here also in this slide. I'm going to focus a lot on the infectious compartment equation. And that equation can be arranged very simply to be shown that it's a logarithmic equation. The solution of it is, is, is an exponential function. And immediately you can see that at the beginning of any epidemic, the disease prevalence will change exponentially over time. And in order to slow this exponential growth, there are four things that can be done. First of all, you can either reduce the number of susceptible people S through vaccination, or you could reduce the number of contacts per unit time through physical distance or other behavioral measures or lockdown. Or you can reduce the probability, transmission probability beta through asking people to wear masks or protective gear, hygiene or through treatment. Or finally, you can reduce the duration of the infectious period by treating people, they recover faster. So, the mathematical analysis of this model without vaccination, when, when the vaccine coverage is zero, is straightforward. Uh, the model has a disease free equilibria that is globally asymptotically stable if the basic reproduction number is less than or equal to one, and unstable if the basic reproduction number is greater than one. And where the basic reproduction number for this model is given by this formula in English is basically the number of contacts per unit time, times the transmission probability per contact, times the infectious period, the, the period that person is infected, infectious. Uh, if we introduce vaccination, this perfect vaccine, the model also has a disease-free equilibria that is also globally asymptotically stable. If the vaccinated reproduction number RV is less than or equal to one, and unstable if the, if the vaccinated reproduction number RV is greater than one. And the formula for RV now includes vaccine coverage. And the, the, the recipe for actually finding the herd immunity threshold 
It's very simple. You quit RV to one and then solve for uh, uh, phi here. And, and the result is what, what, we draw, what we looked at earlier. It is equal to one minus the inverse of the basic reproduction number R naught. So as, as we mentioned, that model makes the, the assumption that the vaccine is perfect. Uh, this model actually extend that uh, model to include an imperfect vaccine. And the imperfection comes in terms of the degree of protection is not 100%. The degree of protection now is given by epsilon. If it is one, then it becomes like a, a, a perfect vaccine. And also that the vaccine now wanes over time. Uh, in, uh, uh, protection wanes over time as given by omega here. And these are the ODEs associated with this model. The rest of the model is similar to the, the other model. And so the basic properties that we introduce here are basically the degree of protection in between zero and one now, and the waning immunity is, is positive now. The vaccine degree of uh, duration of protection is not, is not lifelong. So similarly, the model can be analyzed to show that the vaccination model has a disease-free equilibria that is globally asymptotically stable if RV is less than or equal to one and unstable if RV is greater than one. And the formula for RV now includes the vaccine properties of uh, the degree of protection as well as the waning immunity. And then uh, following the same procedure before, we can solve for the uh, head immunity uh, threshold and find it to be equal to this formula. And compared to the old uh, hit value, you can easily see that you need to vaccinate now more so that you can compensate for the lower efficacy as well as lower durability, as shown here in these two first brackets. Here is a, a simple illustration of the difference between a perfect vaccine and a vaccine that is, uh, has lower efficacy and at the same time also does not last the lifetime of an individual. Uh, the heat value shown on the vertical axis, the degree of protection is varied against the X axis. When if the vaccine has 100% degree of protection as shown by this dot line, dot point here, then the herd immunity threshold is 60%. The blue line is the case where the, there is no waning immunity. The orange dotted line is the case where the, the protection lasts about 90% of the lifetime of the individual. If the, if the degree of protection is lower, like 70%, then, then the, the herd immunity threshold is higher, around 85.7%. If it doesn't last longer as this one, it's 90% of lifetime, then even higher number is obtained, is around 95.2%. So the, the conclusion is like, compared to the case of a perfect vaccine, you need to do more in order to compensate for the lower efficacy and, and, and the waning immunity. Um, there is an important concept uh, topic here that I don't think I'll do it justice if I continue to talk about it, but I, I put some references at the bottom here for those who are really interested, which is basically that simple condition that we showed, which is RV equal to one, is not is no longer sufficient for achieving disease elimination. And, and most of the models we have reviewed so far uh, has what we call uh, forward bifurcation. You have a, a, a disease-free equilibria that is stable less than for RV less than one. And then you have an endemic equilibria that is stable when RV is strictly greater than one. And so you have a, a forward bifurcation. There are conditions, a, a combination of condition that might lead to multiple equilibria where you have backward bifurcation in the sense that you have a stable endemic equilibria coexisting with a disease-free equilibria. In this case, the condition RV equal to one is not 
sufficient for achieving disease elimination. Uh, these conditions usually include others, but I highlighted here two of them, a vaccine that is imperfect and reinfection is possible for somebody who has been uh, exposed before and clear the virus and, and they acquire it again. And so for disease elimination and for calculating the head immunity threshold, we need to look for a lower sub-threshold value for RV, which in turn implies that we need to vaccinate more in order to achieve head immunity. So um, the, the assumption that we've been making so far in all of these models is that the mixing among the population is homogeneous. And, and, and this is really a strong, an unrealistic assumption. There are so many relevant heterogeneities that affect transmission of, uh, of diseases, infectious diseases. For example, age is an important risk factor for mobility, for transmission, for susceptibility to infection, and even response to disease. There are other factors also like social factors like poverty, crowding, demographic factors like differences in gender, geographic factors, uh, the transmission va vary by geography and so on. And, and so these heterogeneities have important implication for the transmission of the virus, as well as the control measures that can be implemented, including vaccination. Uh, I put some references here to highlight um, some of the papers that I've looked at this recently. Uh, including one of them that I'm going to talk more about that I co-authored with Abba Gomel that looks at the importance of heterogeneity in calculating the head immunity threshold. So the, the, the case of homogeneous mixing is very simple and allows us actually to drive really important results and do that analytically but it is not realistic. To add more reality, we need to look at um, heterogeneity in terms of social structure. So for example, stratification by age or social groups. This add more real realism to the model, but it comes also at a cost because it is, it is, it requires, it's more complex in terms of the analysis and I'll illustrate that in a minute. And then if you wanted to add more reality, we need to model like, contact, uh, um, uh, number of contacts and, and mixing in terms of uh, network structure. This is even more realistic, but it comes at a computational cost. And then to account for additional realistic representation of the disease and the interaction among peoples, um, we can we move into a multi-scale structure. Of course, there's more uh, computation needed here. And of course, uh, the most realistic type of model is the agent-based model that takes in the compartmentalization to the extreme by looking at the individual, their characteristics, their movement, their behavior, and the interactions. Um, the, the disadvantage of this model is that it lacks, sometimes lacks transparency and hard to validate. So I'm going to talk briefly about this model that I just mentioned, references at the bottom of the slide, <clears throat> which basically look at heterogeneity in terms of dividing the population into different groups, M distinct homogeneous group. And each group, uh, we divide them in a similar fashion uh, into compartments, those who are susceptible, those who are vaccinated, but they're susceptible V, those who are infectious and those who are removed. And, and the property of the vaccine and, 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 and the like are very similar to the model that I just reviewed. The only difference here is that now we have different groups that are mixing with each other. So this, the force of infection now becomes a little bit more involved and takes into account the differences in, in the probability of transmission by the different groups the number of contacts that they make, as well as the proportion of contact that they make with different other groups, CIJ. 
So uh, we're really interested in, in, in herd immunity thresholds. So we focused a lot on the disease-free equilibria and we show that it exists. And also it is locally asymptotically stable if the uh, RV is less than or equal to one and unstable if RV is greater than one. The, the equation for RV now is a little bit more involved. We take into account the individual basic reproduction number. And this model, this, this, this solution is only for two group model, uh, not the M, M group model. And, and also it takes into account the differential efficacy of the vaccine across the two groups and, and, and also the interaction among the different um, groups. So um, as you can see, now it's becoming a little bit more involved than the simple model that we looked at before. And therefore the question becomes, how can we determine the herd immunity threshold given this type of complexity. And the way we approach this is, is to formulate a problem, uh, a constrained linear optimization problem, where we wanted to minimize the percentage of the total population that, has been, that needs to be vaccinated subject to the constraint that RV is less than or equal to one. And, and the, the figure on the right is a geometric solution for a two group model. And it shows like, so the, the orange curve is the equation where RV is equal to one uh, as, as a function of V1. And so this is the level curve. And then the blue line, uh, the objective function, which is, you can see it's linear. And so the, the movement towards the origin suggests that low, less and less people are, are vaccinated. The, the, the coverage is lower. So, this, this example shows like a case where we have bias random mixing, meaning like individual uh, tend to prefer to mix between themselves rather than within themselves. And, and in this case, the solution is, is this corner solution. It, it makes sense to vaccinate uh, more from uh, group one and none from group two, as given here by the black dot line. The red dot line so shows the, the solution if you pretend that the population is mixing homogeneously. And, and you can see that by the level curves that you need to vaccinate more if you assume homogeneous mixing compared to the case where you have heterogeneous mixing. Under um, the, the, these two figures provide different solutions and the different assumptions if if the, if the mixing is biased towards random in the same case here, but group two now contribute more to transmission, it is optimal to vaccinate more of group two and none from group one. And the situation on the right is for a, for a bias assorted mixing, meaning like people tend to mix within themselves rather than between themselves. And, and in this case, the solution requires vaccinating from both groups, group one and group two, V1 star and V2 star. And the red dot line shows the solution when if you pretend that population is mixing homogeneously. And the, you can see that they're very close to each other this time. And we illustrate that numerically here in these several possibilities that we have here. The panel A here, for example, shows a situation where a group uh, two is actually, even though the size of the group is really small, it is contributing a lot to transmission and the potential for prevention is a lot more. And so it is really optimal to put a lot of effort in vaccinating this group, about 65% of them, and none of group one. And, and the overall result suggests that the overall population, the, the, the coverage that is needed is only 17%. Compared to the case, if you vaccinate equally, you need to vaccinate 95% of these people. The panel B here suggests like you have more heterogeneous and more uh, 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 assorted mixing. And in this case, it is optimal to vaccinate both according to this solution. And, and the solution is very close to the, the case where you assume, if you assume homogeneous mixing. 
And, and the overall coverage is also very similar, but it's always lower with, with the case of heterogeneity. Uh, the, la the, the panel here, C, shows a situation where you, you need to vaccinate all of group two before you start vaccinating group one. And so 100% of group two and 20% of group one. And the result is like the overall coverage 40% compared to the homogeneous case of 56%. Uh, panel D shows the case where it is optimal to focus the vaccination only on group two group one, and the last one here suggests like you need to vaccinate all of group one and 20% of group uh, two. So to summarize, um, heterogeneity under various types of mixing is an assumption, always result in lower uh, herd immunity threshold values compared to the corresponding case of homogeneously mixing population. Uh, but driving that heat is really more involved. Uh, I call it complex here, com corresponding to the simpler model that we looked at. Uh, there, might, there might be no heat value in a heterogeneous multi-population, no single one. You can vaccinate one group, both group, or, or, or the other group. And, and, and the value itself is determined by a lot of factors, including the epidemiology among the different groups themselves, uh, the vaccine efficacy of each group, uh, as well as the relative population size itself for each group, how big they are. And before I, I go on, I would just would like to highlight a common misconception uh, regarding the, the concept of herd immunity threshold and herd immunity. As we mentioned earlier, herd immunity occurs if enough people have, acqu have acquired uh, immunity either through vaccination or through the disease. But the distinction between disease acquired and vaccine acquired immunity uh, lies mainly in the fact that the number of individuals that they get infected through disease acquired immunity is always higher. And also the, the number of people who can suffer from the disease is higher as illustrated by this figure on the right. So in the case of disease acquired immunity, if herd immunity threshold is reached, it doesn't mean that, uh, the, it means like the number of cases are declining, but transmission is still happening. People are still getting infected and getting disease. By the end of the pandemic or the endemic, uh, epidemic, you might find a lot of more people actually being uh, infected compared to the case of the uh, herd immunity threshold. And, and these are the equations that typically people use to calculate the final size of the epidemic as well and compare it to the the, uh, the classic uh, uh, heat value, one minus uh, one over R naught. And, and this is uh, shown more clearly here. And the same example here, assuming that R naught is 2.2, the herd immunity threshold is 54.5%. This model does not have a vaccine in it, but, but the, if, if no mitigation efforts are implemented by the end of the pandemic or the epidemic in this case, 84% of people would be infected compared to the herd immunity threshold, which is 54.5%. So achievement of herd immunity through vaccination is always achieved with less number of people being infected uh, compared to the case of no mitigation efforts. And the herd immunity threshold is not the same as the final size of the epidemic. So the, uh, we touched about a few factors that affects the herd immunity threshold, uh, including vaccine properties and host heterogeneity. Uh, but, but, the, but, the, but the herd immunity is, is, is affected by the intersection between the pathogen, the disease, the host, as well as the vaccine. So we talked about the vaccine property in terms of efficacy and duration of protection. But there are other properties in the vaccine. Sometimes are delivered in one dose, two dose, three dose boosters, and the efficacy of those differ a lot. 
Uh, we also did not talk about the property of breakthrough infections. Infection, when somebody is vaccinated, they get the disease. Typically, these are a lot milder. And as a result, people who, are, who have breakthrough infection might tend to uh, spread the disease at a lower rate compared to somebody who's not. There are a lot of host heterogeneity. We touched only on one of them, which is basically heterogeneity by class. And, and the pathogen, we assume that the pathogen is really well-behaved, is stable over time. Um, but, but as the case of uh, SARS-CoV-2 illustrated, uh, viruses and, and mutate all the time, new variants emerge. So we had the alpha, the beta, the gamma, the delta, the eta, the epsilon, and now we're and the Omicron, and now we're dealing with a sub-variant of the Omicron. And of course, there are also other aspects of some viruses and, and bacteria, they, they have multiple types and they have different strains. So uh, moving on, I'll, I'd like to touch upon uh, the, the, the case of COVID-19 and see if we can actually talk a little bit about that and what is and, com and compare, I mean, what is the health threshold for, for, for SARS-CoV-2? And, and quickly, I know that pandemic touched everybody. Everybody knows about this. So there's huge disease burden. The figure on the right actually is up to date, up to yesterday, actually. It shows like in the US, about 80 million people have been um, reportedly infected and uh, 982,000 uh, people died uh, from COVID-19. We have experienced several interventions. We have really good vaccines. And also we have drugs now to treat uh, SARS-CoV-2. The typical model structure that people use to analyze uh, SARS-CoV-2 are what's called the SVER model. You have a vaccinated, and there is an, another compartment called the exposed compartment included there. And there are an important component called the asymptomatic uh, people who are actually transmitting the, the virus without them knowing that they're infected. So the first question that would be asked, I mean, we, we showed that the formula include a very important ingredient, the basic reproduction number R0. The question is, what is the R0 for SARS-CoV-2? It is very difficult to estimate from data. Uh, most of the estimates that you see in the literature are coming from mathematical models. Initial estimates coming from Wuhan outbreak and the, the Diamond Princess cruise ship put it around 2.2. But the recent um, variants like the Delta and Omicron suggest like the R0 is really high for, for, for these new variants. Uh, some estimate put Omicron variant at 8, which is really highly transmissible uh, variant. What is the vaccine efficacy? Vaccines, uh, at least these three licensed vaccine in the US have really high efficacy against symptomatic disease and also even higher against severe disease and the range from 67 to 94%. Um, but, but this is not the efficacy that we've been talking about. I think the most important uh, parameter for us in these model is efficacy against any infection. And we show that uh, SARS-CoV-2 has asymptomatic infection component. About 40% of people are asymptomatic. And so therefore, I, I think there is the, the critical parameter generally is not estimated from clinical trials. Estimate very widely. The pre-Omicron estimates range from 65 to 90%. Again, it's Omicron. Efficacy against any infection is as low as 30% to 40%. And of course, efficacy varies by the number of doses, whether the person is being infected before or not. Uh, what about duration of protection? Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but it, these slides suggest that there is waning immunity and, and, and it's clear from that because we've been asked to get boosters and all of that. So for the clinical study on the right suggests like uh, uh, for the Pfizer vaccine, uh, initial efficacy is 96%. In two months, it dropped to 90%. And after four months, it dropped to 83%. Still very high, but it shows like uh, the efficacy is winning one time. So efficacy is not perfect. 
uh, efficacy is waning over time. This result suggests like efficacy uh, drops by 21 percentage point for, for these vaccines, the AstraZeneca, the Moderna, and the Pfizer vaccine. So it means like you have a vaccine that is the, the lower efficacy, it's not 100%, the vaccine that winning immunity is there. We showed like if you have those two components, then you need to have a really higher uh, hit uh, to be able to achieve disease elimination. The question is, how are we doing here in the US, for example, in terms of getting close to that hit value? This data is up to, the, up to uh, yesterday, actually, from the CDC. So just like that the total population, the full, fully vaccinated is around 65%. Those who received only one dose is around 77%. Um, as people get older, I think there is significantly higher percentages. Like for example, people who are 65 and above, about almost 90% of them actually are fully vaccinated and 95% of them got at least one dose. Uh, coverage varies widely uh, by geography, as you can see on the slide on the right and the figure on the right. So these uh, more brownish areas is where the coverage is really low, around 30% or so. And, and, and it, it varies also widely globally. Um, but globally, this estimate is about 66% of the global population has received at least one dose. Uh, but there's also wide variability across people. I see some continents like Africa, for example, they look like this, almost all of it is brown. So again, to summarize the COVID situation, we have vaccines that are really great against disease, but lower efficacy against infection. It is not 100% efficacious. Waning immunity is there, it's a big concern. Therefore, we need to vaccinate a lot of people in order to achieve herd immunity. Uh, here are some topics for future research. Um, if somebody is really interested in the possibility of disease elimination, we need to understand the role of these vaccine properties, specifically taking into account these new variants and waning immunity and the different types of immunity. We have immunity against infection. Now we have hybrid immunity. People who got infected, they get vaccinated. And then we have people who got vaccinated from the beginning and their immunity wanes and they get boosters. And we also need to understand the, the role of uh, population heterogeneity. And if, you, if, if the interest is in studying how to manage uh, endemic situations, we need to figure out how to optimally allocate vaccines over time by population. We also need to how to deploy uh, a mixture of these interventions like vaccine, mask, when to implement physical distances and all of that. And we can, uh, we can actually employ like optimal control theory to answer some of these questions. So to summarize, um, I just wanted to mention that there has been a long and rich history actually of using mathematical models to study the spread and control of infectious disease. It goes back to even Daniel Bernalli um, in 1760. Uh, for COVID-19, mathematical modeling has been very, very critical in shaping the early response to the pandemic. Uh, they may exist to uh, hit immunity threshold to achieve disease elimination. The widely circulated and talked about classic formula is very simple. It is determined by a single parameter, R0, but that formula needs to be adjusted upward to reflect the imperfect vaccine uh, properties, as well as downward if you wanted to take into account more heterogeneity. Um, the, the heterogeneity tends to lower the herd immunity threshold. Uh, there may be a different herd immunity threshold when you take into account heterogeneity depending on, on all these factors, the relative epidemiology of the different groups, as well as their sizes. Uh, the major driver for achieving herd immunity uh, threshold for COVID-19 is initially we thought it has a really relatively low basic reproduction number, but the, the recent variants suggest otherwise. Um, what is also encouraging is that the, we have really highly effective vaccines and we have really high coverage in some geographic areas. The major challenges for achieving COVID-19 
vaccine-derived uh, immunity uh, threshold is the fact that the virus is changing now over time and, it, and, and getting more and more variants. Uh, there's also a uh, problem with achieving higher and higher coverage in terms of vaccine hesitancy, compliance, and, and, and the most important thing is also the vaccine properties of winning immunity is also a serious concern. And, and most importantly, also the new, these new variants that are coming up. So I'll, thank you, I'll stop here and I, I hopefully we'll have some time, uh, Dr. Eisendat, for questions. Yes, for a discussion. Very interesting talk indeed, and certainly touches all our basic fears and hopes for the future very directly. Uh, I haven't seen uh, particular questions in the chat, but um, one thing that I'm very curious about is how the vaccine immunity compares with the prior infection immunity. And, if one combined those two, would the map of the United States look greener than it does? I have the sense that many people have been infected and that that might, might contribute. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think um, I've shown one of the graphs there, but I'm not gonna go back to it. But generally, I think, as you said, it's a combination of of uh, immunity achieved through recovery from infection and immunity uh, coming from vaccination. Unfortunately, both of them, they're not perfect in the sense like not sterilizing, not 100%, and, and, and also it wanes over time. Both of them actually naturally acquire the immunity through infection wanes pretty quickly too. And vaccine-induced immunity also wanes, as, as you know, we, we, I've shown some of those figures and, and those two and, and, and vaccine waning immunity in these models are very influential in terms of determining how many we need to vaccinate to be able to reduce the infection. Someone commented that uh, coding theory is being used in this arena. Can you comment on that? um study the compartmental models i don't i don't under, you know, i don't understand the question what can you can you elaborate on the coding theory uh that's the question the remark was just that nowadays coding theory is being used to study compartmental models hamel codes are being used it is the uh comment. Okay. Yeah. So I think one of the fascinating features of the response to this pandemic is that people from various disciplines, including mathematics, have got really interested and in, and in, and in, and produced really interesting work actually. You find like so many applications from various groups um, and background actually trying to um, address some of the questions um, um, emerging from the pandemic, and but but this particular question, I'm sorry, I I, I don't know how to answer that question. So because yeah. I don't understand what the specific use of the coding theory to study compartmental models. Do you see a, a problem that mathematicians could address that hasn't been already addressed? As you said, people have been working on this for good reason. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I tried to highlight some of that, actually. I mean, there's a long history and, and simple formulas have been circulating and they're still being widely used, but mm -hmm. they have, they've been derived under very strong assumptions. I tried to highlight a few of those. Yes. Um, I think mathematicians can, 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 can do more research in trying to understand uh, the capturing more realistic features of, of, of the problem, including the property of the vaccine that I tried to highlight, mm -hmm. um, the property of the national infection itself, and, and also uh, tackle uh, issues related to population heterogeneity. Uh, I think it, it, it's easy to assume homogeneously mixing populations and people look like each other and behave like each other and all that allows to drive really 
nice results, but they're not realistic. So adding these realistic features into the models and applying ma rigorous mathematical analysis to that, I think we can understand more about uh, the drivers for infection, the determinants of, 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 of that herd immunity threshold that we're looking for. Abba Gumel asks, what is the epidemiological implication of heterogeneity, heterogeneity leading to lower HIT while homogeneity does the opposite? Can, is there an a, a intuitive view of that? Yeah, Abba is my collaborator. He should know that answer, but <laughs> no, I, I think so. So if you, if I can just summarize, there are two opposing forces here in the determinants of, of hate. The, if, if you assume a, 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 a vaccine that is less than perfect, then you need to do a lot more under the assumption of homogeneously mixing population. But if you take into account heterogeneity and you can actually target people who are actually contributing more to transmission and there's potential to reduce transmissibility, then you can actually, you don't need to, to work really hard. So there are two conflicting and opposing things. I think combining them might be uh, what we try to do here. We have a better understanding of, of those. 